I'm gonna uh, turn this over to you, Mark and and uh, and Bill and and Luke, and looking forward to this. Great. Well, th you know, thanks so much, Mark. You know, hey everyone, for those who don't know me, uh, I'm Bill Eichler. I'm the Chief Investment Officer of the CNL Financial Group Family Office. Thanks for joining us today for the Cybersecurity Deep Dive. In preparing for this panel, cybersecurity became even more personal for me as on Easter Sunday, my sister's identity was compromised and we believe that the bad guys actually had entry into her bank's software as well. Then just last week, I received a call from the executive director of a nonprofit where I'm a board member describing a chilling call related to our second PPP application. The callers alleged that they were from the government and had remarkably detailed information about our organization, staff, and board members. It turned out that that call was a very professional fishing expedition. So I'm especially grateful that we're doing this panel today. We have a team of outstanding and very experienced speakers, Rick Echeverria from Intel, Lucas Nelson from Lytical Ventures, Jay Irwin from Teradata, Tony Cruz from BNY Mellon, Fabio Fisher from Secure, Dave Krauthammer from Q Secure, and our own Hamlet Yusuf from Iron Gate Capital. Each speaker will have about 10 minutes to discuss their topic and we'll take questions at the end. So feel free to put them in the chat or jump in at the end of the presentations. I'm indebted to my co-moderators, Mark White and Hamlet Youssef for their extraordinary efforts in putting together this panel, as well as valuable contributions from others in the 361 community. So without further ado, I wanna hand the mic over to Rick who will give a keynote and talk a bit about Intel's efforts in cybersecurity. Thanks again, everyone for joining us this morning. Thank you, Bill. And uh, let me uh, see, let me get my screen, screen shared here. Hope everybody can see it. Yes, all right. Yes. Good, good day, everyone. And thank you to the 361 community for the opportunity to kick off this uh, deep dive in cybersecurity. And I wanna thank Bill and my Shield IO teammate, Mark White, for the opportunity. I'm Rick Echevarria, Vice President at Intel. And for the better part of the last 10 years, I've been involved in multiple aspects of cybersecurity in our company, uh, including five years running our platform solutions division. So I'll talk a little bit about my experience there uh, as we go through the presentation. Um, the, at Intel, we have clarity of purpose and our purpose is to create world-changing technology that enriches the lives of every person on earth. And the reason is important that I lead with this and I chose to lead with this is because it tells you a lot about uh, our commitment as a company to positive impact, but it also reinforces that if you have ambitions at this level, you're gonna encounter some significant challenges. And uh, there's no bigger challenges than the threats that we're dealing with in this very same digital world that we as a company are enabling. Uh, I expect all of us here to be aware of the fact that computing has become and continues to become pervasive and the demand for computing power continues to explode. But so that the explosion is also being created by creating these devices, just a tremendous amount of data. You think about retail stores, hospitals, manufacturing plants, automobiles, they're all becoming factories of data. And um, in fact, if you look at the global data sphere, by the time we get to 2025, we will be creating on a yearly basis about 175 zettabytes of data. And that's a big number just for context purposes. If you were to store uh, 175 zettabytes on Blu-ray disc, you've had a stack of this that would take you from the earth to the moon about 23 times. It's just a lot of data. And that's something that we are all contributing to, right? This fact, we're part of the factory of data. We are in, in an era of distributed intelligence where all this data that we're creating has to be moved, has to be stored, has to be processed. And we hope that all of that is happening at high performance, and with the right level of security, right? And more than ever before, Bill's story is just one of 
millions that probably happen every single day. The data that is being generated by all these devices and all these processes is actually really important. It's a source of value for us, source of value for our businesses, it's a source of value for our customers. It's a very important asset that needs to be created. And I think that it's important to understand the implications of this grow in compute capability, almost everything that we have around us is computing, and then the grow of data. There's exponential growth on both sides, and the combination of growth in data and growth in compute and growth in devices is enlarging what all of us here in the cybersecurity world understand very well, which is the surface area of attack. And that's a common uh, sort of understanding, right, that what we are doing for better or worse as we try to grow our businesses, transform our businesses, create, create, create more and more data, we are expanding the surface area of attack. So there's more and more surface area for us to protect. It's one of the biggest challenges that cybersecurity defenders face every single day. And there's some implications of this growth of compute devices and the growth of data to the security landscape. And I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on this slide. I think it's important to understand. And I want to start on the left-hand side with that big number there, $10.5 trillion, which is the projected annual cyber crime cost to the world by 2025. And you ask yourself, well, how did this happen? How did we get to a point where this just has become a massive source of revenue um, for, for that part of the, you know, it's, it's an industry in and of itself. And over time, uh, as both hardware and software continue to evolve, there uh, and and people and talent started to understand more and more about computing and systems got more sophisticated again we started creating those uh areas of potential areas of attack also known in cybersecurity terms as vulnerabilities and there's just a lot of well-funded talented individuals that have a high motivation that number it's a high economical motivation for them to improve the skills and invest in attacking those vulnerabilities, capturing assets and generating their own version of value, albeit for nefarious purposes. So there's a tremendous amount of economic motivation and funding to continue to build capabilities and expertise to attack vulnerabilities of systems that are becoming more and more complex. And I think this imbalance is between the economic motivation of the attackers and the funding that's being provided to those to this, that are trying to defend systems, that imbalance is exacerbated by the fact that many of us, probably here in the audience, still think of investments in IT as a cost center and not a value generator. And so it's taken quite a bit of time to start understanding the importance of making those investments in IT. And even if you wanted to invest in cybersecurity, as somebody who is investing in technology, you know that the demands for IT services, it's exploding and cybersecurity is just a fraction of that. And I'm gonna to touch on IT priorities in the next slide because just to make sure that we align on what is it that we're trying to balance across the board. But finally, I was really encouraged as I was preparing for this to, he to learn that 62% of IT execs are increasing their security budgets. Long overdue, I think cybersecurity has now become a standard board level discussion that's actually helping, especially as people understand that if you don't inve invest, you're putting your business at significant risk. And if you have a vulnerability, somebody's going to find it. I mean, there's a lot of talent out there, right? If you look at the impact of COVID-19 in this landscape here, it's actually created its own version of challenges. In fact, I have colleagues in the cybersecurity industry, but the other day I was talking to Bimal Solanki, who's one of my colleagues at CrowdStrike, and he was reminding me that we as individuals have all become part of our business's perimeter, right? Because we're all operating more from home, we're accessing systems from home, we're accessing data from home. That's really expanding that surface area for attack. By the way, there's a hint in there, identity, is one of those areas that is really, really important to both as an investment opportunity, but also as an area of investment for you as you're trying to protect your business and your assets. The other point, one more point I wanna make here is uh, that 75% number that you see on the lower left 
Uh, that's the number of companies that have been attacked by ransomware one way or the other. I bet these companies all made logical decisions about protecting their endpoints. They made logical decisions about protecting their network. They made a lot of logical decisions to try to protect their business. They still, um, you know, were impacted. So I think it's important to note that um, you have to continue to invest. You also have to understand that you're not going to be able to catch everything you have to have in place mechanisms to protect you have to have mechanisms to also recover your business when when you end up getting attacked okay one more a couple more points here lots of increasing regulation so when you take the combination of what's on the leftmost column the increasing regulation no surprise when you look at the yearly spending in cybersecurity and how significant that's been and the tremendous growth in spending from 2017 to 2021 uh, I mentioned earlier the, uh, the challenge of investments in cybersecurity when you start looking at all of the priorities that IT and IT teams have to juggle. And probably many of you in the audience are dealing with this every single day. The interesting thing is that if you look at the four um, areas that we're trying to balance, three of them, obviously the non-security one, they actually in some way, shape or form can impact your cybersecurity investments. What do I mean by that? If you look at improving productivity, most of that at some point in time is going to involve buying more hardware, buying more cloud services, investments in software, generation of more data. As I mentioned at the beginning, improvements in productivity tend to have an expansion effect on the surface area of attack. The reduction in downtime. You decide to keep your systems running a little longer and put away a patch, you're opening yourself for attack. So when in doubt, patch, something that most cybersecurity uh, professionals will tell you, it's, it's worth the investment in keeping your systems at the right level of security posture. And then when it comes to controlling costs, which again is another um, big point of pressure and focus for IT, you have to think about the fact that, you know, being short term in your investments in cybersecurity, it could potentially cost you in the long run. So... These, those three priorities, along with the fourth one, cybersecurity, we understand they're part of that balancing act that we're all trying to make. But I think it's important to understand the implications to exposing your organizations to cybersecurity attacks if you don't do this in a balanced approach and you don't understand the implications of improving productivity and reducing downtime and controlling costs on your cybersecurity posture. Um, as we go through the panel, by the way, we're going to touch on how we balance these priorities to try to ensure that we minimize these risks. And we're also going to give you an inside look into some very interesting areas, both for deployment of security within your businesses, but also invest potential investment areas. Uh, before I wrap, I thought I'd share this picture. I, um, one of my colleagues put together this slide. This is a day in the life in the COVID-19 area, right? It really does describe our new workday. And what this does is really it reinforces the points that we've been making and the fact that we have become part of that enterprise perimeter uh, and also to raise our awareness for the fact that this blending of, you know, that blending of our personal and our work life, it can further expose the systems that we used to work, right? What's happened to our workday, the boundaries between the personal and the professional have pretty much evaporated. There, though we're not traveling as much and we don't have eight hours at the office, but some people don't. Um, and, um, and we're, you know, again, traveling less. We have a lot of expectations for our devices as uh, enablers of this modern work style that involves this work from home environment, right? And we're going to be using these same systems to connect socially. Maybe we're using the same systems that we used to work to connect to the educational institutions that are helping educate our, our children online. And again, all those connections, all these different applications potentially running on the same systems as you're drawing your business are creating further and further exposure. So this is one of the many, many challenges that we're going to deal with. And I think post-COVID, this sort of blending of personal and professional is pretty much going to be here to stay. Uh, just a couple more slides. Um, at Intel, we take a holistic view uh, that includes the development of technology. So what we try to do with all the technology work that you see here at the top of the iceberg is to really help our partners and, um, and our ecosystem mitigate the risk 
But the other important aspect of the work we do is this concept of assurance. And assurance doesn't only apply to a hardware or a technology development company, it applies to all of us, right? And assurance processes, putting processes in place that are specifically focused on mitigating risk are really important for organizations of all types and all sizes. Finally, I've included a few links here uh, to sources of information so you can understand our approach to security. I've also included a link to our uh, Partner Alliance Marketplace where you're gonna be able to find global partners that have integrated Intel technology. Many of them focus in helping you deploy solutions in cybersecurity. Hope you find those links useful, but if you don't, you know, we're here to help. You can always reach out to me and I'll try to match make you with the appropriate partner. And one more, one more point. Um, I know that we had some specific questions that we were preparing for this presentation that you wanted us to touch on. Um, just some, some um, opportunities, some ideas for you to think about as you move forward in this um, journey of trying to mitigate the risk of your, for your business. First is always ask your partners or your vendors about their security and privacy by design practices. Understand how they develop technology, how seriously they take this. Also look at your supply chains holistically. And when I think about a supply chain, I don't think of just the typical physical thinking of a supply chain, but the data, the digital assets that you're managing, where do they come from? This, con this concept of provenance is really important. Where was that hardware built? Where was it manufactured? Where did it come from? Same thing with the digital assets that you are dealing with. And then don't cut corners on process. When in doubt, as I said earlier, patch. And finally, as you're thinking about areas of focus, both in terms of securing your business, but also in terms of investment, identity, and cloud security, cloud security are two opportunities uh, that you wanna think about and explore. And with that, I wanna thank you for your time and attention, and I'm gonna turn it over to Mark White. Uh, thanks, Rick. That was a terrific presentation, a terrific overview. Thank you very much. Uh, well, those of you in the 361, uh, ecosystem know me as uh, managing partner of Prairie Cross Capital. Uh, I'm really pleased to have taken the CEO role at Shield IO, which is a uh, as well, which is a uh, next generation encryption technology for enterprises that's easily deployable and scalable. We're very lucky to have Rick on our board. So uh, now that I've kind of reset that, uh, thanks again, Rick. Uh, and uh, the next speaker will be Lucas Nelson from Lytico Ventures, which is one of the leading uh, institutional. Uh, venture investors in cybersecurity. Lucas, you ready? I think so. Thank you so much. Let me make sure I can get my slides going. Can you see them? Great. Let's try this out. Great. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Lucas Nelson, uh, Lytical Ventures. Uh, we do early stage corporate intelligence investing. Uh, that's kind of an umbrella made up term, uh, but the way we think about it is cybersecurity, data analytics, and AI. So I'll jump in. Um, a brief, brief background, here's my team. Uh, I'm there in the center. Uh, and my history is um, hacker turned VC. So for the better part of a decade, I broke into computers for a living, uh, pen testing. And um, I switched sides of the table probably about 10 years ago to do early stage venture capital. Uh, so I'm not going to assume everyone knows what that means, so I'll explain a little bit about um, what we do, and then I'm going to dive into mostly the private market, the private security market, what's going on uh, in investing, but I'll also touch on kind of public market uh, comps as well. So uh, Lytical Ventures, uh, we raised about $35 million in 2019. Uh, we're about two-thirds invested in that fund. We'll finish up our investing soon. Uh, this isn't a pitch for the fund, so I'll, I'll skip most of that. But as I said, we invest in cybersecurity, data analytics, and AI. And so the core thesis is corporations have woken up to an obligation to their data. They need to protect that data, turn it insights and wisdom, and monetize it. So we invest in startups that do those things. Uh, we generally play in the series A. So that's usually companies that are uh, doing somewhere between 500,000 to $2 million of revenue, um, but we'll go earlier. You know, in the seed rounds, and we'll go later in kind of the, the series A plus to B rounds. So we invest 500,000 to three and a half million dollars. Uh, for that, we get five to 20% ownership, often with a board seat. 
um, we're pretty hands-on with our companies. So, you know, we, we speak to them, uh, if not on a weekly basis, a monthly basis. Uh, so we're, we're pretty active investors. Uh, right now, our portfolio is about 12 companies. I'm not going to talk about them, um, but we invest kind of across the breadth of, of cybersecurity and AI. So corporate intelligence is a booming market. Uh, as Rick touched on, um, of this market, a, a majority of it is, is cybersecurity, though AI is quickly coming up the pipeline. So as a total, it's a 28% CAGR, but cybersecurity alone is still above a, a 25% um, uh, annual growth rate. Uh, and so given that kind of growth, one might think, oh, I can get three monkeys and throw darts and I'll make money investing. Um, and that's not totally untrue, but I will suggest that having domain expertise is helpful uh, for at least the reason that uh, good security looks exactly like bad security until something bad happens, right? So if you go to the websites of many security products, they all sort of sound the same. And it's the underlying technology and the way things are actually done that makes that valuable or not. Uh, an easy example is encryption, right? So you're going to turn a set of one, you know, a set of data into encrypted data. And for most of us, looking at that encrypted data, you can't tell whether that encryption is super strong or easily breakable, right? It does visually, it doesn't, uh, uh, it all looks the same. So you have to have kind of underlying knowledge. Oh, sorry about that. So this is the monthly funding in in cybersecurity. Uh, in, in the private markets. So this is VC and a little bit of PE. Uh, and as you can see, um, the, you know, the fundraising is booming. Um, you know, 2021 is already on pace to be 2020. And uh, the secret there is 2020 was a record year. So I've got a bunch of, uh, of data here um, on that. I, I'm not gonna read each slide to you, but globally about 8 billion uh, was invested last year. And we think that it's going to be more this year. Um, back when I graduated business school in 08, 09, uh, cybersecurity was pretty out of favor. Um, there was slight tick ups since then, uh, in, in those years, but since then it's been a 9x increase, right? And the US is the biggest part of that market, right? $6 billion. Um, Interestingly enough, the second biggest market for startups, not market uh, as buyers, but creators of cybersecurity companies is Israel. Um, that is because of, uh, they've got a, a very strong uh, military uh, complex in, in 8200 is the name of the group. I won't dive too deep into that, but since everybody goes into the military, a common thing is to do two, three years in the military and cybersecurity and then uh, spin out and form a company around the things that they, they learn. So um, it's a great place to be looking for cybersecurity uh, technology if you're gonna invest early stage. Uh, another nice data point, uh, last year in 2020, six uh, new unicorns were minted in cybersecurity. A unicorn is a company with a billion dollar valuation. Uh, we've already had nine in 2021, right? So again, that, that momentum is, is shifted pretty heavily now, uh, the creation of a, a unicorn is a lagging indicator, obviously. All the growth of that company happened in 2020 and prior. So it's a bit of a lagging indicator, but you can see that there's a lot of value uh, being seen in, in kind of large uh, cybersecurity companies. Um, the other thing we like to think about in cybersecurity is uh, even if companies aren't going public, uh, and, and, and many are now, but even if they aren't, they're highly valuable uh, and they get acquired uh, pretty readily because the um, the teams are so uh, so important, right? So there's a one million open jobs in the United States in in the cyber industry and two million globally, and so uh, many companies are willing to you know hire entire teams, buy up teams to get that um, to get that talent pool. So I said I'd talk about the public markets. Um, a lot of that value being created or, or, or being seen in the early stage is because of what's happening in the public markets. So that big fat line is uh, high growth uh, cybersecurity companies and how they're beating the S&P, right? So that bottom line, the little black thin one is the S&P. You can see that even low growth cybersecurity is matching and beating the S&P. 
if you're medium growth or high growth, you're really getting paid well for that. So you see companies um, like CrowdStrike getting 37 times next 12 months. Uh, that's um, frankly, you know, uh, kind of insane uh, valuations being seen in the public market. But it's because that cybersecurity spend, as Rick was talking about, uh, is just continuing to grow. Um, so having said all of that, I like to look at this and say, you know, there's still room for cybersecurity to grow, even though uh, it's, you know, we're putting up record years of investment, um, you know, cybersecurity at, at 8 billion is still less than robotics, right? Uh, and then FinTech at 27 billion, I'm not saying we should invest as much in cybersecurity as we do in FinTech, um, but I do think that there's plenty of room to grow there, especially as everything moves online, uh, you know, cybersecurity only becomes more important. As ransomware uh, ratchets up, the, the spend on defense gets more and more important. Um, one of the ways I like to think about this is cybersecurity is an arms race, right? So uh, at any given time, you've got your attackers and your defenders, a new technology comes out. Uh, for, for instance, let's talk about IoT. As IoT gets rolled out, Attackers discover these devices, discover ways to attack them, and then defenders have to come up with a new series, a new, um, a new set of tools to defend that. Uh, and the nice part for cybersecurity investing uh, from your, your standpoint as, a, as an investor is that you can see where the puck is going, right? You can, you can sketch where the puck is gonna be. Is okay, IoT is gonna be a thing. So cybersecurity will probably lag that by a few years is it's not until uh, deployments get to scale, right, that, uh, that attacks really happen and thus the, the defense starts to happen. So right now you might say, well, 10 to 20% of companies have IoT infrastructure. Uh, when that gets up to 50%, attacks will really start to happen and that's when the cybersecurity spend will follow. So um, I, I love to hear about this stuff. I'm happy to talk about it all day. Uh, you can easily reach me, Lucas Nelson at lyticalventures.com. Um, I'm going to leave it there, but thank you for your time today, and I really appreciate it. Lucas, thanks for a great overview of the cybersecurity investing landscape. It certainly is growing, and uh, my first response when I got involved in the space was that it's a tremendously complex area. So I thought, no, we'll touch on that a question and answer area. Just like to know if Jay or Irwin is on, so that I am. Uh, okay, Jay. Jay Irwin okay. is with uh, Teradata. He runs, uh, he's the director of the Cybersecurity Center. For those of you who don't know Teradata, I'll put in a little plug for them. They are the largest supplier of data warehouse databases to enterprise organizations globally. And they kind of fly under the radar in our world, but uh, uh, they shouldn't. Um, so Jay, you ready? I'm ready. Share your screen. Sure. Now, is it on the same, is it, is it part of the merge deck? It is. You can share it from your yes. file directly. Oh, from my file directly. Up I'm to you. Sorry. I have to do that. My bad. It will take me just a second. Or Jay, if you'd like, I, I could share my screen, whatever you like. Um, I've got it. I've got it up. Okay. And all I've got to do is share my screen. Did I share my screen? No. Okay. How about you put your? How how about you put it up? You may you may get it done faster than I. You see it. There we go. Yeah, there we go. All right. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, panel. Thank you both, Marks. Thank you, panel. I'm Jay Irwin. Um, I'm the director of Teradata Center for Enterprise Security, recovering lawyer by trade, security geek since 2000-ish, maybe 1995. <clears throat> I run a group of people who are all out of the United States and we are in an analytics and data warehouse company, 
but we are the we are the due security arm. We are a last mile organization. So we go out to every customer in the world remotely today, mostly and otherwise physically or remotely, and we actually do security for these um, multi million dollar uh, enterprise machines with many nodes, many systems, many system types in the cloud, on prem, and so forth. We are the ones who get on the keyboards, apply the security controls, test them, diagnose them, fix them, make sure they're working, and uh, try to help people sleep at night. So that's what we do, that's what I do. And we do want to help uh, a CISO sleep like a baby at night while hackers try to steal your high value data, as I've said on my title here, to, to provoke everyone. Let's see, am, am I gonna need you to? Yeah, just let me know. That? Okay, so I wanna talk about why we look at the things like the Verizon data breach investigation report and other seminal sources every year and we look at it and data breaches are growing, <clears throat> not shrinking. And we, 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 some people can rightfully say, why aren't our defenses working? And so what I really wanna focus in on today is why, why defenses aren't working, where they're not working and how we can efficiently and effectively um, allocate our investments to make those defenses work. And I want to start out with a couple of maxims. Number one, uh, if you didn't already know this, your network is always under attack, period. By everybody who knows you, knows of you, and doesn't know you. Hackers have a very indiscriminate pattern. Sometimes it's the supply chain. Sometimes it's you. Sometimes it's a, uh, a bad let go employee or a bad not yet let go employee. Sometimes it's just somebody mining for money, but your network is always under attack. Mark. Number two, risk and vulnerability will never by definition be equal to zero. We have to do the very best we can with our investments and our time and our talent to mitigate risk, well, first we have to identify it. We have to identify risk, we have to identify vulnerability, we have to connect them up, figure out how likely they are, figure out where we think they're going to attack, and that's all predictive. Because that's predictive, it will never equal zero. But we can sure do a great job getting it close to zero. And that's that's what that's where we should put our money is uh, and our time is in the things that will help risk go down as low as possible in real life. Mark. Uh, so maximum, maximum number three is a few fundamental controls will, will dramatically reduce the likelihood of a successful attack. And that's really what I want to spend my time on, Ed Mark. Uh, there are five critical capabilities for managing risk that most folks would agree with. You know, we can add to this list and we could make it 10, but these are the five biggies that will take out the biggest hunk of risk uh, out of our environments. And when, by the way, when I say environments, I, I mean our hardware assets, our software assets, our, our network borders, our infrastructures, our clouds. Are, are clearly today hybrid environments and our data centers, our offices, and especially our people, our workforce. So if we manage our hardware environment well, if we manage our software environment well, if we have a plan, a configuration management database that's current, that's up to date, that is fully vested with the knowledge of the industry and we always keep that up to date. If we manage vulnerabilities on a day-to-day -day -day basis, uh, and vulnerabilities, by the way, are managed by this entire country and probably the other countries that my colleague mentioned uh, yeah, in the list. Every day in the United States, for example, 
the National Vulnerability Database puts out a list of common vulnerabilities and exposures called CVEs and rates them. Uh, they rate them with a, a scoring system called CVSS for, and it's based on criticality. Let's just say that 10 is really, really bad. And there's a lot of 10s out there and you can see these every day. And so we have the ability as security people in a country to every day manage our vulnerabilities down to the lowest possible level. And that's uh, an area that we should be taking very seriously. I know from my point of view as a last mile security professional that not everyone does this the same way. Not everyone does with this with the same fervor, uh, expense, resource commitment uh, that they need to in order to not be on the phone, end up on the phone with somebody like me uh, saying, oh my God, I have a thousand vulnerabilities on my system, what do I do? I, I, it's, I want that call and I don't want that call. I want that call because I want to fix the problem for that customer. I don't want that call because I want that customer to already have solved that problem by having taken the advice that I gave them when we were in strategic mode, when we were in planning mode, when we were talking about what your security strategy ought to be. And Matt, lastly, in the, in, in the big five, malware defense. And this is by no means uh, just an antivirus control. Uh, this is, in fact, the systems I deal with, which are Unix and Linux mostly, uh, the the virus the antivirus defense market is tiny. Um, we're we're not we don't seem to be the the focus of uh, of viral and, and and that type of attacks. Now, having said that, our commercial our big commercial and uh, public sector base is full of vulnerabilities waiting to get at us. So I don't want to minimize that at all. It's just not, they're just not antivirus. There are other more customized forms of malware. And the thing about malware defense is that most of it on the market as an investment is based on blacklist. A signature is seen. It's a zero day signature. It's analyzed, it's understood, and it's put on the bad guy list. So it's a blacklist. Now, uh, the next day, there's another one, or there's two more, or there's 10 more, and we've got to discover them and put them on the blacklist. So that's a race, that's like, a, that in and of itself is like an arms race, hacker versus good guy, black hat versus white hat. Uh, the things that make more sense um, in this area are to focus dollars and time, whitelisting and determining malware, the existence of malware, identifying it, stopping it before it does its damage based on behavior. Uh, some of us call it UEBA uh, or uh, basically it's called, basically to crunch it down, it's behavior analytics of IT processes clear down to the network packet level. When we can focus our dollars on analyzing network packets because of patterns that we know of, because of patterns that we learn of, that's where we can make a good investment in malware defense. Doing these five things will reduce 80% of the attack surface. And that's not all of it, but that's a lot. The three things that are most common in data breaches are either one or more of credential theft, uh, failure to have up-to-date patch management, and misconfiguration of our systems and our software. And usually it's a combination of all three. Doing these things help reduce it, helps reduce um, making mistakes in all three. And of course, there are other things like security education for, against spear phishing for credential theft and so on. Next slide, please. So I wanna talk about cost-effective security controls. I had a slide on 
cost ineffective security controls. And I thought, well, let's just spend the time on cost effective controls and just drive, try to drive that message home. Multi-factor authentication is a fantastic, strong and effective security control because it knocks credential theft in the, right in the head. Um, if you do it the correct way. In other words, if it's truly, if you use true multi-factors, something I have, something I own, something I am, someplace I am, those are the four factors. If you use two or more of those in your identity management, when a user says, let me on your system, you've done a great job against the person who went up on LinkedIn and uh, maybe sweet talks you into a connection when in fact this is a person you don't know and uh, what they're really trying to do is figure out intelligence about you and ultimately land your credentials. That happens daily. So multi-factor authentication and there are wonderful providers. They, they exist throughout the federated authentication and identity management systems. They exist through independent companies that can be bolted on to our enterprise applications. The thing is, make the investment and do it. Um, we've made the investment uh, in our application security to get this in uh, so that it's always going to be available. And we, we highly recommend that to CISOs who are making investment decisions. Data loss prevention with user logging and monitoring is an important control. What are, it answers a simple question, but it's a big question. What are my users doing on my network? And are the users on my network even supposed to be there? Uh, we can alert on things. We can sit around the table and come up with really great rules that we can take our parsed data and have us be alerted on. Why is that DBA scanning repeatedly uh, a sensitive PHI data column when that DBA has no access to data? Don't I wanna know about that? Of course I do. That's one of a million examples. Encryption or tokenization or, or some form of data changing data masking to make high value data useless. And you notice I didn't put sensitive data there. I put $3 signs. And that is intended to mean my high value data, my regulated data, my sensitive data, my intellectual property, all of that data has a high value to me. If it's the thing that I make my business out of that makes my business successful, it's high value data. If it's something that the regulators are going to find me a, a half a billion dollars if I screw up on, that's high value data and I got to protect it. Any way you look at it, it deserves those three dollar signs. And uh, encryption or tokenization, you'll notice as every rule, every new rule, every new privacy rule, every new security rule comes out, you'll see how they all include a provision for letting you off a little easier if you encrypt or tokenize your data. And that's hey, because, I'm sorry. Hey Jay, uh, we're starting to run out a little bit short on time here. Uh, okay. so could you, well, I'm could almost you done. Bullet points real quick and uh, yep. don't want to interrupt you. This is fantastic information and I really appreciate it. So. All righty, all righty. Anyway, the idea is if they steal it, it's useless. Advanced threat protection and for, uh, we've talked about that. How to, how to identify and avoid indicators of attack and indicators of compromise, bi-directional stateful firewalls as opposed to unidirectional. And then I'm gonna put in a quick plug for cyber hunters. These are people that go beyond the senior security analyst. These are the people that can run around in a sock and uh, they're like the special operator. They're like the Delta Force or the Navy SEAL of the security operations center. These people are worth three times their salary. And I think I have another, I think I have one more slide. This is uh, for you just to look at what a good layered defense approach looks like. It contains access control, multi-factor encryption and more. The point is it relies on no one point of, no single point of failure. And the last slide. 
uh, the second to the last slide. Don't check that box. Uh, you, you don't have to back it up. Don't check that box. In other words, CISOs encourage the people that you have doing vendor evaluations, application security evaluations. Don't give them a, a, a board with a pencil and say, check the box. Put a person on that that knows what they're doing and is experienced and can really evaluate that solution. Is it going to be an effective investment for me? What you'll end up with is this slide. And whereas you may have started on the left with uh, key mandates and base controls, as you quickly mature through, through good investments, you'll end up making business priorities drive your security strategy. And that's the ultimate that you want. You don't want security driving business. You want business driving security. And that's how your investments will pay off and that's how you won't get breached. And those are the basic things I wanted to cover because those are the things I deal with every day. Yeah. So I wanna thank you for your time, especially the marks and the moderators in the panel. And uh, we're always available for questions. Thanks, Jay, I appreciate that very much. Uh... You know, as you can tell, Jay's very passionate about cybersecurity. I've known him a while, and uh, he's one of the more passionate people I've ever met in the sector. And uh, with that, we're going to move on to give you an enterprise perspective from Tony Cruz, who's a senior vice president of Bank of New York Mellon. Tony, uh, on and ready to go. Uh, yes, thank you. Hello, everybody. Let me go ahead and pull up my slides here. Share screen. One second. Uh, I can be your backup again if you want. Yeah, if you could, please, because uh, security setting on, I'd have to shut down and restart. I didn't think about that. Thank you. Um, so, hello, everybody. Uh, Tony Cruz. Uh, I work for Bank of New York Mellon. I'm a principal cybersecurity architect uh, focused on next generation technologies. Um, next gen for a, a GCIFI, uh, uh, a global systemic and important financial institution is you know cloud, blockchain, a lot of the things that you're hearing in the press about uh, uh, now. Next slide. Quick agenda. Um, I'm going to move through this pretty fast. Um, I, I, some of the previous panelists uh, hit a lot of the topics that I'm going to hit. Um, so, but this is a little bit more targeted towards the family office space. Next slide. So recent targets, I'll let you read that um, and let that sink in. But the biggest one here in February 2021 was Sequoia Capital. Um, I imagine, you know, well, the, the sub bullet, you know, investors include private uh, wealth, family offices, sovereign, sovereign wealth funds, university endowments. And so, you know, Sequoia represents $3.3 trillion in, in market value with the companies in, in, in the companies in which they're invested in. So, you know, for you family offices that are doing business with these VCs, right? Um, um, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Think about, you know, how that impacts you. Uh, one of the things that's not mentioned often is law firms, and I, I, I put these bullets specifically, and I'll tell you why later. But law firms are getting are starting to get hit. You know, um, just like VCs, we're we're almost certain that law firms and and VCs are not really reporting their breaches uh, to the extent that banks or some of the other public companies are. Um, but uh, don't think it's not happening. Next slide. Okay, here's another one. Three British private equity firms were tricked into, you know, transferring uh, 1.1 million pounds, right, uh, following a sustained uh, attack by cyber criminals. Next slide. So family offices, you know, the perfect target. Why? Right. Um, well, uh, family offices control significant wealth, right? Um, however, Unlike a GCIFI, uh, a, a global bank, or even you know a, a more robust uh, a regional credit union, there's a good chance that you probably don't have the cybersecurity defenses that 
you know, um, me and my team focus on or, you know, some of the other uh, uh, larger players in this space and not just financial institutions, but, uh, you know, um, some of the hedge funds, some of the other uh, uh, entities uh, operating in our financial markets, right? Um, family offices likely lack uh, in-house IT or security functions, right? Um, it's just a fact, you know, the smaller the are, you are, the more likely are you are to think, why would uh, a threat actor want to hit me, right? Um, next slide. What it comes down to for me, at top of mind, when I think about, you know, hey, if I were a threat actor, why would I want to hit a family office? Hey, intellectual property, right? Material, non-public information. Who are you doing business with, right, as a family office, right? The larger you are, the larger of a family office that you are, you know, the, 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 the larger amount of entities you're doing business with, you know, for, for, for all I know, somebody in this audience could be um, uh, doing business with, uh, with BNY, BNY Mellon, right? Um, uh, we service a, a lot of uh, family offices, right? Um, you know, you could be doing business with Bridgewater Associates, for example, right? Um, and and, 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 and what, when that, where that matters is when you start talking about supply chain attacks, if I hit you, right, and you have weak controls, but yet you have direct access to my networks and, and more importantly, my data at BNY Mellon, you know, and there's nothing in between to stop that, then I'm screwed as well, right? Family offices, uh, go back, please. Can you go back to the previous slide? Yeah, thank you. Family offices, uh, uh, drive economic growth, right, at global, national, regional, and local levels. So think about the impact of, of uh, you know, you as a family office and, and kind of how you impact your, your economy. Next slide. Next slide. Yep, thank you. Uh, so recommendations is buy or build and operate a zero trust, least privilege, and layered cybersecurity posture. You know, uh, we keep hearing about uh, zero trust. That's actually uh, gaining a lot of ground and, and a lot of people are paying attention. And that's because you have to assume that your networks are already compromised, right? The larger you are, the more data you have out there, the more devices, the larger your attack surface, right? Um, you have to be in defense. You have to be right 100% of the time. You know, uh, a threat actor has to be right only once. And he has advantage on his side because he can take, you know, whether a month or three years to recon your networks before uh, a, a, a breach uh, or a uh, exploit actually happens, right? Focus on your identity and access management, and that includes authentication and authorization controls, right? Inspect your traffic, right? If, if you don't have the, the, the organic capability, hey, you know, Lucas and some of the others talked about, you know, the billions, uh, the, the, the multi-billion dollar cybersecurity market. There's plenty of vendors out there, you know, that can help you do this, right? Um, again, review and validate your third-party controls. Uh, you know, supply chain, solar winds, right? Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of these large uh, institutions and not, not just talking about banks, but uh, across the different verticals, energy, you know, so on and so forth, um, are being hard to vet your third parties, you know? How much access to, the, to your data do they really have, right? How much control do they need to your, you know, uh, within your network and your systems, right? And challenge them on this. Next slide. So in summary, you know, um, I suggest you, you know, focus on your data. Um, the traditional model has been, hey, I'm gonna build a network-centric or network-centric segmented network. Um, I really say, you know, focus on your crown jewels. What's your most important data, right? Put that at the center and start layering your defenses around your data, depending on how you store it. And that, that's whether you're on-premise, meaning in your own physical network that you control, should you have one, or in the cloud, right? One thing to point out about the cloud is that the cloud was built and designed for open architecture. Open architecture means it's easy to share data, 
right? It's easy to share access, you know, how much, look at how much sharing you want to do, right? Again, always assume your network and your devices have been or are compromised, right? I mean, even in government, that, that was the, the assumption. I spent many years in government, um, you know, hey, somebody's always in our network, right? Um, and most of the time, that, that's actually fact. Next slide. Next slide. Yes, thank you. Um, again, assess and audit your third parties. Um, the process of third party risk management is, is critical. Uh, you know, in addition to incident response capabilities and being and, and identity and access management, access to your data, right? Vetting your third parties, you know, uh, especially with, you know, with the current ability to outsource everything through SaaS platforms, right? Or, or infrastructure as a service platform or, or platform as a service, you know, in cloud computing, um, you know, focus on your third party, you know, your third parties, you know, if you're outsourcing a incident response to them, for example, right? Okay, focus, think about, you know, how are they gonna alert you? What's the timelines, right? Um, assess your risk exposure against your risk tolerance, right? Um, it's, never, it's never equal, right? Ultimately, cybersecurity is a business decision, right? I, you know, technologists disagree with me when I say that, but it all comes down to top and bottom line and, and, your, and your risk tolerance. Next slide. And that's all I have, pending your questions. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Tony. We'll we're going to take questions at the very end. Yep. Um, you know, I think you helped tie something together here, though, that Rick began talking about, Lucas emphasized, uh, and then uh, uh, Jay really emphasized, but you helped tie it together is that that surface area that we're trying to protect, we're all interconnected. Yes. And we're all interconnected by design. And it's a vulnerability, and I think some of the other panelists will get to how, what that vulnerability looks like in the future and how, how enormous it is. Okay. So next, we'd like to, uh, so thanks again. So next, we'd like to introduce Fabio Fisher-Aguiar. We've got a couple of uh, examples of other startups besides Shield.io here uh, to talk about the solutions and innovations that are happening in that landscape. And Fabio is also from uh, his startup, Secure, Secure is based in France. So Fabio, are you ready to go? Yes, Mark, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm just sharing my screen here, just a sec. Uh, can you see my screen, uh, Mark? Right. Thank you very much, everybody. Nice to meet you. Very good uh, thoughts already put in the table here. Uh, Secure, I'm uh, Fabio Fischer. I'm a Secure CEO. We are a private, a cybersecurity cloud-based software company. Uh, we are based here in Sophia and Tipoli Science Park in, in France, in the, the in this region. But we operate strongly in Latin America and we start our operation right now in the United States also. Uh, the main focus on Secure side is to guarantee a very safe flow of data information, uh, doesn't matter uh, which kind of uh, device that our users are, are in, uh, taking place. Uh, is this is smartphones, IoT device, etc. So we are a zero trust uh, cybersecurity platform. Uh, the market size and the, the problem you know everybody is talking right here. The world has migrated to mobility, and not only to smartphones but apps, IoT devices, connected devices. Uh, the COVID remote work needs right now is speed up a lot of challenges also in the, the, the network. So how to ensure security uh, to access a huge number of, of IoT assets or IT assets, software systems. Uh, the, the, the key point that we're seeing today in the, the trade here in Europe because GDPR, but also in the United States is to protect the data. Uh, so uh, safe is not more than local action into a data center, it's all around now. So hackers are stalling credentials. Where are these credentials? In apps, 
in systems endpoints, uh, then that's a, the big problem today that we're facing here. Of course, because you have a global data regulations compliance, a lot of fines are being applied in that point, but the losses, losses also came from strategic data leakage that can cause a lot of money loss and business secrets that we're saying that. And of, in the other big point here is about cyber terrorism. So the, the hackers and the terrorists right now, they understand that it, through a network by a camera, maybe they can access the system of the other company. And that, I have a very strong case here that we're working here in France right now with the a city hall that have a, a, a very strong uh, smart city project and they face a huge problem data leakage through the camera leakage. So that's the, the way that we're thinking the market. Uh, what we see right now very strongly also guys, is that all if you have, you have to have a risk view when you talk about data protection. So we are talking about uh, integration between cloud, app, endpoint, and network. So it doesn't matter if you have a very uh, safe data center cloud structure, if your stakeholder is at home using a third part app, and sometimes the hacker go to the app and through the app store the information. Further than that, the hacker can access the endpoint. So the main problem that the, 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 the market's facing right now is how, how to ensure in the single platform, a single way, uh, guarantee a very safe communication program platform or process, integrate human to human, but also human to machine and machine to machine. So uh, I have a very uh, example that happened here that the, the client, uh, for example, they are uh, accessing the IoT device remotely in a very strong and safe way using a private key, a passwordless protocol. But in the end of the day, they call to talk strategic decision the company using free new apps or cell phone. So the data leakage is more personal and processual than technological. So uh, the way that we're seeing the technology today, first of all, you have to guarantee a very strong way of authentication to protect the, the, protect the data. Oh, sorry. Protect the data. Uh, and you cannot use password, token, login, the regular one. We are talking here about uh, private key generated randomly, autonomously in the cloud and download in the safety area of the smartphone to protect biometrically this, the, this technology. And this key is only exists inside the safety area of the user, not on your front. And then you have a, a very strong model to interchange information in the company with chat, voice, video conference, file sharing but also to authenticate by internet and access all the uh, uh, assets inside the company. IoT device, a database, a cloud computer, and a virtual machine, server, website. So we had to bring to the edge the passwordless authentication protocol also. So we had to generate a very safe way to install the agent inside the IoT device on the doorway to access that. Then you can ensure a, a very safe protocol in connection information between the user and the, uh, and the edge, the, the software, the system, and the IoT. Just to give a sense here, our, our neighbor here in the UK, they are about to launch a data regulation specifically for IoT manufacturers. Regarding the IoT, the, the data regulation in general, they are being specifically saying that all manufacturer that produce connected devices, they cannot use default password in, the, in the, the hardware. They have to guarantee a very strong identity management protocol and ensure that everyone legitimately authenticates in the, in the network that are accessing the IoT devices must be uh, uh, audited for compliance reason. So uh, the, the, the regulation, it's coming down each, each more because the cybersecurity problem, uh, 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 cyber terrorism uh, challenge is, is a very, very key 
in Europe right now, but I know that the United States about uh, has the exact same the same problem. So the the gener the major view here is very strong authentication protocol to generate no repudiation is a, a, a because GDPR or LGPD or data regulation says that you have to guarantee that the people that are doing uh, uh, some kind of activity must be auditable. So the technology must be very strongly authenticated to ensure that. And everything encrypted by the source through the, the, the smartphone or the IoT device, because the data collection must be guaranteed also in that structure. Uh, a, a major global trend, because this reality, uh, we are talking about here passwordless uh, process. Or, 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 what, what are you going to say about that? The, uh, we are not saying here to ride, uh, hide the cheese from the rat. We are saying here you have to remove the cheese from the equation. So the hacker today, and I think Ricky or Lucas Nilsson talked about that, is if the, the main focus to the hacker today is stall the credential, the user credential or the hardware credential. So if your credential is based on numbers, password, token, it is very weak way to protect. So passwordless authentication is a very strong trend around the globe today. Using smartphone as a token for authentication is growing to transform your smartphone in a, as a, in a credit card, to keep the key and protect by biometric, to guarantee all the folks uh, safe. Yeah. And uh, very strong market traction. This is a report that uh, was released last year. Uh, and we see all larger enterprises, small B2B business are very keen of, of uh, concern about mass and security. Uh, and we have a lot of discussion in the United States recently about WhatsApp and Facebook, uh, credential and authentication and safety and privacy process. So the companies right now are very key to look. I don't want to depend on third part apps that doesn't guarantee very safe process belong to me for, for identity process. So they are key to understand how to have his own mass and secure process. The identity and access management also is what we were just talking about here and to guarantee the endpoint encrypted process also. And we don't, you, they cannot use in the endpoint uh, password, the, the regular password process. You must be a passwordless process also integrate. So this is the main key. And the other one, guys, the, uh, uh, which is a ge geopolitical affair is about sovereignty. Uh, how, uh, just a sec, yeah. The, a world trend of a, uh, is going to a micro private network. Everybody's saying, or talk about the boom of cloudy. That, and you have to guarantee and use the cloud because only through the cloud, you gain scalability to download a lot of private keys in, remotely and automatically in millions of places. So uh, cloud is important. But the cloud must belong it, it be under the company umbrella. So the main, the main, the main company is uh, very concerned of, with all the flow of cybersecurity. Then say, okay, I would like to have a, my, a technology, private label with my own brand, but the private cloud must be mine because I want to guarantee the, the, the sovereignty, the ownership of the, my company information inside that. And I, I cannot depend on government or the third part company. So the other very strong trend in the market is a micro network for the company uh, who guarantees sovereignty uh, in, in much of the time with the white label. They want their own brand, their own structure inside that through the private cloud. Uh, that's a general overview that we're searching and seeing here in the market globally. And uh, by the end of the, the, the call here, I'm available for go deeper in some uh, cases uh, and explore some doubt that you may have. Hey, Fabio, thanks for that great overview. And it's a perspective that I think brings home that it's a global solution that we're working on with Israel. Someone mentioned Israel being a hotbed of innovation and cybersecurity. You know, Fabio's from France. And it gives you an idea as well as the next presenter of what people are doing and startups are doing to address very specific parts of the security uh, surface and the interconnected interconnectedness. So the next person that uh, is going to, going to present is Dave Krauthammer. He's CEO of Q Secure. 
which is a startup that's focused on the threats that's, uh, that are posed by the, uh, the impending arrival of quantum computing. So Dave, if you're ready to go. Thank, thank you and good morning. Can you all see my screen? Uh, yes. Great. My name is Dave Crothmer, CEO of QSecure. Um, I was a CIO in Telcom, started a company that went on to uh, become Oracle's largest cloud partner, sold that. Um, so the team, we've got a really strong, strong team. Our CTO is a, a renowned CISO in financial services. Our, our CRO uh, wrote the quantum design sprint. Our chief product officer is on the quantum futures board at the World Economic Forum, Forbes under 30 in quantum, uh, Stanford AI. Our head of engineering um, is JD and a computer scientist who worked on some of the fundamental um, cryptography, satellite cryptography. Uh, we have the former CTO of the Air Force and CTO of AT&T Government Systems, CTO of RSA. Um, really strong team. Uh, let's talk about a little bit about current cryptography. So cryptography is something that's not often discussed, but our current cryptographic systems are broken in that our, um, they are very chatty. A lot of the attacks we encounter, like solar winds, is a certificate attack. Um, they are vulnerable to quantum and other emerging threats and unable to really adapt to the current threats that we're seeing. So the cryptography itself is unable to adapt to threat patterns. Um, and you know, one of the challenges we face is we're chartered with protecting our networks, but we're also responsible for our data for a long period of time. That can be 25 to 75 years, depending upon how critical your data, what kind of PII it has. So if your data is stolen and put on a server in a foreign nation, um, you're responsible for it for another 50, say 50 years. So we've got to be very careful. And right now, the way data is encrypted on your servers, on your backups, if they are stolen, um, they will likely wind up on a server in a foreign nation. And um, you know, we've we've read that China is is uh, is capturing much of our encrypted data and putting it on servers. So uh, kind of scary proposition um, and like. So these new forms of cryptography, which we're gonna go into, protect um, your data, your assets um, from these coming quantum threats and other threats. Um, there's gonna be a long upgrade cycle. We work closely with Jack Heidery at Google X, um, who runs Quantum and AI, said this is gonna be a multi-trillion dollar upgrade. Um, and you know, again, your data stolen today is uh, at risk of being decrypted down the road. A little bit about quantum physics. So hopefully at the end of the day, at the end of this discussion, you guys will walk away with your PhD in quantum physics. So a traditional computer, a traditional CERT processor has uh, a bit and uh, 64 bits usually, and that's a word. So we process these words really small, really quickly. And they've been great for linear problems. Um, they work great for linear problems, but there's a universe of problems out there that are not linear in nature. So enter a quantum circuit. A quantum bit is one zero or anything, and they're connected together into a circuit via this phenomenon in quantum physics called entanglement. The beauty of this is that I can take, I can upgrade from a word size, it's like 64 bits, to for say Google's bristlecone, to it, it, the circuit is 73 qubits or two to the 73rd, or a Yoda bit of data, which is equivalent to all the data stored in the world in the last year in one instruction. So it's great for massively parallel problems like simulating molecules or neural nets. The challenge is it's also really good at factoring numbers, which is the basis for all our cryptography or almost all our cryptography. So these quantum computers pose a real threat um, to our current forms of cryptography. Um, there's been a lot of activity is, that you've seen in quantum, and they're really starting to scale, um, really starting to scale these systems quickly. Little background. So next time you guys are at a dinner party and someone says, how many quantum bits, or how big of a quantum computer does it take to break cryptography? You can tell them for asymmetric, for RSA and elliptic curve, it's two times the key length plus three. So approximately 4,100 quantum bits will set the key length for RSA to zero. That's Shor's algorithm. And the proposition of this is really kind of scary because at that point, then all our security is rendered useless. And we are rapidly approaching that 
um, that marker. Um, you guys, if, if you've looked at quantum at all, there's been a huge number of advancements in quantum computing, even in the last year. Um, and the problem with quantum computing, the challenge has always been noise, because I'm manipulating atoms and subatomic particles. Any noise is detrimental to the circuit. But in the last year, we've really started to get a grasp on how to reduce the noise. So there's been announcements from many uh, vendors, um, IBM, SciQuantum, um, that they'll be at a million quantum bits by 2025. So we're rapidly approaching um, this inflection point uh, where um, all our current forms of photography are vulnerable. Um, in the defense bill signed on the 31st, uh, the Pentagon said all agencies have to be prepared for this quantum threat. It is eminent, it is now, and we must be, um, we must be prepared. And uh, China is ahead of us and certain foreign nation states are ahead of us. And um, they're focusing on cracking our cryptography and very mindfully and then very outwardly, they're stating it very clearly. Uh, so there's, uh, <laughs> yeah. And by the way, the blockchain's vulnerable too because with quantum computers, you could theoretically do a 51% hack on the blockchain and, um, and experience those vulnerabilities. So QSecure, we protect your data at mo in motion and at rest from these quantum threats um, on any system anywhere. So the bulk of the investment in quantum security has been in hardware. You might have heard of QKD investments. We're a software only solution. So these hardware solutions are still a ways out there. Uh, they're cumbersome, they're expensive to upgrade your network. We fit right over your existing network and make it quantum secure and a whole host of other capabilities. So again, any system, anywhere, whether it's cloud, whether it's edge devices, whether it's supporting identity on your handset device. Um, we also have what we call intelligent cryptographic orchestration. So we, we mentioned that cryptography, the challenge with it is it's one size fits all. So I give you a size nine shoe. If you like it, great. If you don't, you're gonna have to make it fit. So our approach is what we call self-aware cryptography where we're making adjustments uh, based on threat patterns. So um, these devices can prepare themselves and respond to attacks. Um, we have a high-speed protocol that, uh, that makes us super fast and we're standardized on military grade and NIST standards. This is just a little diagram. You're, you're gonna have trouble consuming this in one, one state, but in essence, we take your network, whether it's cloud to cloud, any system to any system, data in motion or at rest, and we make it quantum resilient from these threats. We have applications in banking, DOD, energy, telecom, cloud providers, networking, and healthcare. And let me be clear that all companies and industries are not treated equal when it comes to threats of cyber hacking. Banking is at the top of the list, finance, energy, telecom. So there's target areas where, where there's a lot of focus from the people who are trying to attack our networks. And so we have custom tailored solutions for those particular networks. Um, just as a side note, the Biden administration came out and said they were gonna increase the spend on quantum from 1.2 billion in the last administration to 300 billion. And in this infrastructure plan, the $2 trillion infrastructure plan, there's $180 billion in just research. Um, so it's a, it's a rapidly growing market and we have a software solution that gets it in your network now and it conforms to fundamental standards from NIST and, um, and the like, that's it. Hey Dave, thanks a bunch. You know, the, 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 the us being in cryptography as well, we're all working on uh, solutions to, to protect our future. And I, that was a really great overview of what your guys' efforts are. Thanks, thanks so much. Um, so next up, uh, uh, next up we have um, uh, Hamlet Youssef. I've known Hamlet, uh, I've met through the 361 platform. And what I would just say, is this is gonna be a really exciting presentation I'm anticipating at least my anticipation, because Hamlet's one of the smartest people I've ever met and really has a really broad and deep perspective in cybersecurity, both as an investor and as the active participant. So Hamlet, take it away. I, I will be sure not to disappoint. So thank you for the introduction. Uh, this has been a great panel. 
uh, the folks at 361. Uh, appreciate the invite and the opportunity and uh, looking forward to hopefully sharing some good, insightful content here. Can everyone see my uh, screen here? Yes? Yep. Okay. Yep. My two favorite people. So uh, we, we, we talked a lot of tactical. Um, I'm going to go uh, a bit in, into the macro and come back to tactical in terms of what this means for the audience, the family office network here on 361. Uh, just a quick uh, bio and background. My name is Hamlet Yusuf. I'm one of the managing partners at Iron Gate Capital Advisors. We are a early stage uh, venture fund or venture co-investment platform. We invest exclusively in technologies that have a direct application in the national security defense arena. Uh, we tend to be early stage venture investors. We come in post seed, series A, generally is where we come in. Uh, we invest side by side and in some of the best uh, leading funds uh, in the US that focus on this space. What makes us uniquely different is we invest uh, based on our insight and our network. So most of the partners and the board members associated with our fund um, come with significant executive, uh, prior executive experience within the federal government, primarily in the areas of national security, intelligence, diplomacy, and defense. So with that active insight into the community, it allows us to allocate capital um, on, on a much more efficient basis. And we're actually an LP uh, and uh, an investor and a partner with Lytical as well. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about kind of what the evolving landscape of technology looks like um, and talk about how it pertains to national security specifically, um, but how that uh, applies to economic security and why it matters to this audience where cybersecurity plays a part in that. So there's a quote here that uh, I have been quoting uh, going back three, four years. I think Brookings Institute uh, took that quote and consolidated it, but uh, Xi and Putin are on record saying, whoever leads artificial intelligence uh, in 2030 will rule the world in 20, uh, by 2100. Uh, this expands into a couple other areas, not just AI, but there's some key critical technologies that are reshaping the future of society. And, and Xi and Putin, their, their view is if, if they can get to a position of dominance in, their in those technologies, they can then uh, dictate geopolitical, economic uh, security demands and, and edicts uh, globally. Um, cybersecurity is a big, big component of that. Um, and that's an area that we obviously specialize in. So real quick here, um, how we got here and, and where we're going. Uh, what this slide really uh, basically encompasses is going back in, in, the, in the 1960s when we were in the first Cold War, um, the U.S. drove um, investing in innovation and demand or innovation and technology. And a lot of that was driven from the federal government and key prime uh, contractors or defense contractors. What we saw is we saw that landscape change um, over the last 50 to 60 years in a post-Cold War word, world where um, the, the U.S. played a, a, a smaller part in innovation and driving innovation research and technology. Um, and the rest of the world began to grow, up, to, to grow significantly. If you look at that middle pie chart, uh, the two things I want to call out, obviously, is a split between the 40-60 in terms of how much the U.S. was driving innovation versus the rest of the world. But look how small China was uh, at 3%. Um, and look what they are, where they are in 2017. And that pie has grown since then. Um, the U.S. is starting to lag when it comes to investing in innovation and design and technology. Um, and what we're seeing is China uh, take over that gap significantly. Um, now, this isn't meant to be a, a, a knock on the, on the Chinese people. Um, I think they have a culture that's rich in history that dates back thousands of years. But when you look at what's happening in China, um, particularly how the Communist Party um, in China is using technology and innovation, uh, for lack of a better word, to control and, 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 and rein in their populace. So a couple million people within the party controlling 1.3 billion people, that could be a model for what's to come for the rest of the world. Um, technology is going to be a key, key driver in that. Um, the areas of innovation that I think the federal government is paying quite a bit of attention to, um, as are we as investors, uh, fall into these five buckets. Um, I'll touch on all quick, real quickly, data analytics, artificial intelligence, cloud processing that also would, would capture computer vision and quantum computing, unmanned systems, robotics, uh, ISR platforms, so intelligence surveillance, reconnaissance, and crit critical in in infrastructure and key resource protection. Those are all key areas where the, the technology disruptions are happening at such a, a, at such a pace that government um, and even some of the bigger prime uh, contractors within the defense ecosystem or even the, 
the, uh, the private sector cannot keep up with that pace of change. That pace of change, that disruption is happening at the startup level and that innovation is happening at the venture level. Cybersecurity, both offensive and defensive, uh, intertwines and, and, and touches every one of these areas. Um, so when you look at the advent of quantum computing, when you look at uh, the, uh, the growth of AI, when you look at uh, how we're getting to the point where we have autonomous weapon systems for offensive and defensive purposes, keeping those systems secure and hardened becomes critical. Uh, the, the, folk, uh, the point that uh, QSecure made about quantum computing, um, that is one of the probably two or three holy grails of this technology arms race and innovation arms race that we're in right now between us, China, and Russia. And the reason why quantum computing matters so much, uh, and I'll just put it down in basic layman terms, the, the first country can, that can really crack the code on quantum computing can now basically encrypt everything that they have to the point that nobody else can hack it. Um, on the other side, that they can go ahead and decrypt and hack and compromise any system that's out there. So it doesn't matter how long your password is, doesn't matter how good your your 256-bit uh, military encryption is, doesn't matter about the blockchain, um, quantum computing is, is gonna be that much of a disruptive force. So you can see why there's a lot of effort and a lot of uh, attention being paid um, into this arena. So how does this all relate from a, from a macro standpoint to the micro? Um, let's take a look at SolarWinds as an example. Everyone heard about this. Um, I, I strongly recommend you guys uh, look at this article that NPR put out uh, about a week ago. It does a really good job of laying out the, uh, the SolarWind uh, attack and timeline, how it took place. Um, this is a, almost like a 2.0 version of a similar attack that we saw coming out of the Soviet Union, or excuse me, Russia, uh, that was called Nanpetya. Uh, that was back in uh, the what 2014 timeframe. It was right before uh, the Russians uh, uh, encroached upon Crimea. So what these are are examples of what a nation state attack looks like on, in, on enterprise and infrastructure. Um, the, the implications, the impact and the damage that was caused by solar winds here in the US, I think is going to be an ongoing, ongoing scorecard. Um, from the information that I'm privy to, which is no different than what you guys are, it looks bad. Um, from what I'm hearing, it's probably a lot worse uh, once people who really dig into the, uh, into the details and see what kind of damage that was done. But both of those are examples of a supply chain attack. Um, it's an attack where a, a, a weak point within the uh, software supply chain is identified, it's compromised, and then from there it's used to propagate and advance and, and grow and take down an entire network. So why does that matter to you all? Well, what we're seeing is in, in our thesis as, a, as an investor, although we're a bunch of shameless capitalists and we wanna make as much money as we can for our investors, uh, we're doing this because there's a sense of mission. Uh, we do think that we are in a technology arms race um, against the, uh, the, the Chinese government and the, and the, and the Russians. Um, I think this arms race is manifesting itself almost into a second cold war, if not a third, war, third world war. Um, I don't think we're looking at a point where we're going to have columns of tanks marching against each other, uh, but I do think asymmetric warfare, unconventional warfare, is going to be a key driver of geopolitics here in the 21st century. So uh, attacks on enterprise, uh, compromising systems, uh, compromising election integrity, uh, disinformation, uh, misinformation, fake, um, fake news or, um, or, or deep fakes, which are um, uh, computer images that are rendered to look like a real person and saying something that's off character or, or whatnot. Those are all real uh, attacks that we're starting to see become a key part of geopolitics. The reason that matters to you all as an audience is these tools that are, that are starting be, to, be, to be used against us from a cybersecurity standpoint, th these aren't uh, a couple of kids who are, who are out uh, hacking away for, for, for fun. I mean, Hacking in general, going back to the late 90s and, and early 2000s, it was, it was, it was more of a, a cat and mouse game. Um, it was a, almost like a victimless crime. You defaced a couple of websites, you, you changed your grade, whatever. Uh, there wasn't a, a lot of hoopla around it. What we saw is we saw that activity significantly become uh, monetized by black hats or, 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 or malicious hackers over the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, what's transpired now is people who are hacking um, or using tools to, to, to compromise networks and systems, they're often working with either directly or indirectly uh, as, a po as a proxy for a nation state. So whether it's the North Koreans and the Chinese trying to attack uh, Sony uh, and, the, and the amount of damage that caused uh, or the variety of attacks that have been um, alleged to come from China or Russia over the last couple of years, this is an example where the intelligence service of those, of those countries is actually working with, half, with hacking syndicates um, and using complex tools to compromise uh, systems. What's scary though, is some of these hackers that are out there 
uh, and they're working for the, the Russian intelligence service or, or the Chinese intelligence service by day, their job is to attack CIA. Their job is to compromise our elections. Their job is to, uh, to hack a bank or to go after Lockheed Martin or, or a defense contractor. That's what they're getting paid to do. In the afternoons, in the evenings, uh, in between breaks or whatever, they're using some of those same tools and trade crafts to go after uh, what the military would call soft targets. But what's a soft target? It's basically anyone who's not really hardened uh, to deal with that kind of attack. So think of family offices, think of accounting firms, think of law firms, think of small, middle-sized uh, companies that are susceptible to having a supply chain attack, to having somebody come in and compromise their networks and attack them where they now control their banking account or uh, they're, they're taking the, the, uh, the systems over and, and, and restricting access and using a, a ransomware uh, approach because for them, it's just a, it's a simple revenue generator. So that's the world we've, we've fallen into. Um, so I think it's, it's important and it's critical um, for us to be cognizant that, that technology has gotten to the point where it's being used to better society, but in the wrong hands um, with the wrong intentions can 100% be used uh, to hinder um, kind of the economic integrity and the, and the trust that we have as a society in Western values um, in terms of systems actually working. So that's a critical, critical area of concern. Um, I think Lucas and several of the folks uh, on this call uh, mentioned uh, we are in an arms race. Uh, that arms race is based around technology, but it's also based around cybersecurity. So you have an entire cadre of black hat, act black hat actors out there trying to attack and compromise networks. And you have people who are white hats who are using that same computer science technology to understand how to pen test and how to defend organizations. And it seems like there's a, a never changing pace of, of, of technology advancements that are reshaping that landscape. Um, if you look at cybersecurity, heck, even four or five years ago, um, if you spent an X, X amount of dollars, had a couple of pieces of software that were network defense, network identification, you're good. But what you're starting to see is that you're starting to see that entire landscape change. What you're starting to see is a, is a big movement to zero, thought, zero trust authentication, uh, meaning uh, a significant higher level of, tr of lack of trust, I guess, of, of other software coming into your computer. And I'm trying to boil this down into a into a very simple um, uh, paradigm here, but there's a there's a constant back and forth of one upping each other in terms of what kind of technology and what kind of tactics are being brought to bear. So it's imperative that 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 fueling of of, of investment maintains and grows. Um, it's very important for family offices, both as investors, but also guardians of their own interests, uh, be very well versed in terms of what is the latest um, in terms of tech trends uh, and tech stack for you to maintain within your within your enterprise, but also what are the areas you need to invest or not invest or divest from because of disruptions that are happening uh, within, within the cybersecurity landscape. So those are all critical areas uh, that I think uh, demonstrate how cybersecurity is impacting uh, the landscape as it stands. Um, a couple of key things in terms of what's happening from a macro standpoint, um, Quantum is obviously a big area of focus for, for defense uh, spending for the federal government. Um, there's a lot of, um, I guess, a, a posture right now to significantly increase that. Um, there's actually an article came out uh, today. I think uh, we're, we're looking at bipartisan support legislation going through, uh, calling for $100 billion in investment in disruptive technologies uh, by the federal government to harden our technology infrastructure uh, within the U.S. Um, in a very divided society, uh, the U.S. Is, is, is kind of looking itself at right now. I think it's really good to see that key areas of investing in technology, innovation, and defense and cybersecurity is an area that we're seeing um, a lot of collaboration on. But um, without getting into this slide key by or, or line by line, um, it, it looks like as of right now, um, although there may be some longer term impacts on the overall federal budget, the 2021 budget for the DOD compared to the 2022 budget for the DOD for the most part uh, looks for the most part in line. I think there was an anecdotal joke that uh, when Biden announced this number, he pissed off the left and the right. So in DC, it kind of means you're doing something right and something that's more moderate. Um, but I, I, I would not be surprised if you see a, a, a some erosion of the overall defense budget um, in the next several years as we get into more austere situations. Um, but I think what you're going to see is you're going to see a trend that was begun under Obama that was continued by Trump and it looks like it's going to be maintained by Biden is going to be a rebalancing of where and how we spend money. Uh, seeing cybersecurity budgets increase, I think, is a good thing. Seeing the overall defense budget increase is well, out for discussion of whether that's good or bad. Um, I do think you're going to see a push where more legacy programs, weapons programs from the 20th century that were meant to, to fought 20th century wars are going to go away. 
So um, do we need another Abrams tank? Do we need another A10, B10 tank killer? Uh, probably not. Do we need to reallocate those dollars into autonomous weapon systems? We need to allocate those dollars into satellite systems. We need to allocate those dollars into AI and quantum computing. We 100% will need to. Um, as we do that, we also need to make sure that we're allocating money into protecting those enterprises, both at the, at the nation state level, uh, but also at the enterprise level. That's where cybersecurity comes in. Uh, the other one point that I want to uh, really stress is when you're talking about cybersecurity, um, it's, it's easy to focus on making sure that you have the right cyber stacked or, or layer of, of defenses in place uh, for your enterprise. So having the right software, having the right uh, um, uh, series of, 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 of programs in place. But there is one key absolute 100% footstop critical element that you also need to be wary of. And that's the services associated with training and, and just vigilance. Because at the end of the day, uh, and I've seen this number fluctuate anywhere from 90 to 80 to 70%, but let's just say a vast majority of compromises or hacks that have happened almost always will include a human element, meaning somebody within the organization was manipulated, co-opted, either um, wittingly or unwittingly to violate protocol and enable access to the system for a bad actor to come in and, 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 and hack the organization. So training and vigilance is, is, is key. Um, it's, it's trusting and understanding who you're dealing with, wh whether it's by email or not. It's having proper hygiene um, on social media and, and, and how you project yourself out out in the world so you're not as much of a target. Those are all things that, uh, by God, I mean, we could probably do another four hour call here to get into that and uh, spoiler alert, uh, that's the plan. I think this was this call was meant to um, give everyone um, a, a broad view of what the cybersecurity tech landscape looks like. And I think we could probably go back and do another series of calls over the, over the summer where we can tactically dive into detail of, okay, if you're a family office and you want to allocate capital and you want to really invest in this space, who are the folks you, you want to invest with and in and, and, and alongside? Um, for that, I would say insight is critical uh, because if you're not a real estate developer and you want to invest in real estate, what do you do? You partner with a developer who knows the local area. Same thing here. If you're a family office and you want to invest in, in cybersecurity or, or disruptive tech, um, if you don't have the deep Rolodex to really understand the technology and the ecosystem, your best bet is to partner with the right folks. Uh, same thing, uh, probably do a, a follow-up call uh, where we can get into tactically in terms of, okay, if you're a family office or if you're a ultra high net worth, what are the things you should be doing tactically uh, to protect your, your, your self-interest, your data, and your enterprise? So uh, this is an area that I'm very passionate about. Um, I can talk on the, about this for, for hours on end, which I will not. Um, but uh, I'll hand the, uh, the, the mic back over to, uh, to Mark. And I think we uh, will now go into uh, Q&A, I believe. Correct, Mark? Correct. Uh, thanks, Hamlet. That was a great overview. Uh, and it also emphasized, I think it tied, the, it, it, it tied it together in another way. This is not only uh, criminal organizations we're dealing with that want your money. A, these are nation state actors. And there's a vicious cycle between the nation state actors and uh, the criminal element. They're codependent and they're symbiotic. So, you know, I think, you know, I've also become really passionate very quickly about cybersecurity for that reason. So we've taken a lot, I, I've been tracking a lot of the questions here uh, that you've been asking. And uh, I think it, I can, I'm, I'm gonna try to boil them down into three specific questions and then we'll just open it up to for discussion on, uh, that evolves out of that. But one of them is, given everything we've discussed today, um, this is to the panel and any panel member that uh, would like to answer, uh, given everything we've discussed today, what are the key takeaways at the macro level on how the cybersecurity landscape will impact family offices? And I think Tony touched on it a little bit in his talk, uh, but uh, what would you say that, you know, let's say that one or two things that uh, you know family offices really need to be focused on? Um, so, so two things. So family offices, a growing trend with wealthy families, will be increasingly at risk of attacks for ransom and data theft. Uh, as in energy or other sectors, threat actors may also want to hold uh, wealthy families at risk, right? Um, flip side is family offices will have an expanded field for which to invest, but an expanded field also means more players in the space. So, you know, pay attention, you know, uh, pay attention to your risk tolerance. Great. Would anybody else like to contribute to that uh, question? 
Like I just going back to what, what what I said earlier, I think uh, when you see disruptions, uh, disruptions usually uh, lead to dislocations in the market, which lead to opportunities to invest and divest. So um, I think for, for family offices that want to be on the leading edge there, um, you've got to understand what's happening. Um, I think we've heard the, uh, the analogy, you want to be where the puck is going, not where the puck is. So investing in disruptive technologies and cybersecurity uh, really has to follow that model. Um, if you're not well-versed, um, you need to partner up um, and partner with and co-invest with uh, the folks that are really in the trenches and understand what that disruption looks like, but understand what the adoption and the commercializ commercialization of those opportunities look like, both within the federal government, but also in the private sector. Yeah, another, another thing, guys, that, that, you know, security is broken right now, and there will be massive, massive investments to replace what we have now. So there's going to be a cycle over the next five or 10 years that's, that's going to swap out everything we have. And. There's, there's huge opportunities there. Yeah, I would gonna, with that there. Troy, one, one last thing. Um, you, you often see with CISOs uh, kind of a, a swing of a pendulum back and forth between you know investing in a lot of new shiny technology and then trying to get it all to work together and, and back and forth. I, I think we're about to be in kind of a retrenchment phase. Uh, I, you know, a lot of the CISOs I spoke with last year said, you know, hey, I've got all these boxes, I've got all these things, I need to get them all to work together. And then the pandemic hit, it really kind of paused everything. So instead of doing that rationalization, they instead figured out how to get everyone to work from home. And so I do think that it's a, we're gonna be in a market where it, it really does, uh, the, the people pulling everything together and making it all work together are gonna be have the advantage as opposed to the point solutions this year. But, um, you know, Tony, you'd be a better person to talk to that than me. I, I, I definitely agree. I mean, I get bombarded. I mean, sometimes we have, uh, you know, VCs that, that come and shop their companies over to, to BNY Mellon and, uh, and I sit with them in a room and sometimes I'm hearing seven different companies offering the same solution. I'm going, guys, <laughs> you know, um, I just spent $300 million, for example, last year on certain technologies, you know, and I, I need to be able to put this together and 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 figure out the 90% solution for these tools before I can go out into the market shop for for more to fill in my gaps. That's a terrific answer. Thanks. Thanks, Lucas, for, for framing it that way. I really appreciate it. You know, the one of the other topics that's come up is a combination of topics, and I think it relates to uh, this nation state actor thing, quantum computing. So I'm going to tie it all up in one question, uh, but it'll be three different topics, one of which is you know, what should the United States be spending on quantum uh, computing compared to other nation state actors at this point? Uh, not what we are spending, but are we spending enough? But that's also tied in with a question from Tom Jump, I believe, about who do you think the winners and losers ultimately will be, you know, of that race? And um, are, are they going to be leading, you know, technological and economic powerhouses as of today? Yeah, I think Helmut pointed it out. It's that when you control quantum, you control security. And so there is a there is an arms race that's going on right now, and that is the arms race. And China is way ahead of us. They're a, a clear and present danger. And so I think when if you if you take the two categories, there's quantum computing and then there's quantum security. There's also quantum sensing, but so in quantum computing, um, that that um, we're still behind, but as a nation, you know, our leading companies, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, they're all investing heavily in this, and we're going to get to an inflection point. The, it's closer than you think. We are closer than you think. And then we don't really understand what China has. So the likelihood that they have much more powerful quantum computers than anyone's putting out a press release is likely. In terms of quantum security, we're spending, the bulk of the spend, like I said, is on hardware solutions that are still a little exotic. So uh, China said all their, um, all their satellites, all their government and military will be fully quantum secure 18 months ago in 18 months. So they likely already are. We are way behind. And um, so in terms of quantum security, there needs to be a massive investment now or before now, because I mentioned steal now, decrypt later, if, if they've been harvesting your encrypted data, it's already too late. So uh, in quantum security, there needs to be a massive upgrade cycle. And there's the realization in DOD, the, the spending last administration was $1.2 billion. 
in the in the uh, infrastructure bill, it's going to $180 billion. And Biden has said $300 billion, a cornerstone of his presidency. So there's there's a lot of attention on it, but we, we need to actually follow it through and make it happen. Um, anybody else want to? Oops. Oh, um, looks like Mark froze, but uh, any any other uh, contributions on that one? Um, you know, otherwise somewhat related. Uh, there, there's a question in terms of, you know, where are VCs, you know, putting their money right now and their view on, you know, more on the most innovative technology that's happening. So, I know, you know, Lucas and, and, uh, and Hamlet, do you want to take a stab at that? And then, you know, maybe the other guys in terms of what, what you're seeing as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in quickly and then I'll let Hamlet take it over for me. Um, I like to think about, you know, the, the idea that uh, the security um, investment follows IT investment, right? So as we see containerization happening, well, security for containerization is an obvious thing that's going to happen. But containerization took longer than, than we sort of expected, right? Uh, you know, most uh, companies are now kind of getting 50% containerized, right? So we're not really even at scale there. And then you look at the new things coming down the pipeline, like Kubernetes, right? These self-healing you know, annealing networks. And the visibility of what's going on in that network is vastly different than kind of the old racks and uh, stacks and racks that we used to have. And so there's going to be new tools there, but people aren't quite sure, you know, what Amazon or Google or Microsoft is going to do for you and what you're going to have to bring into that environment. So I like those areas a lot. IoT, I like a lot. Um, quantum is another one that, you know, we've talked about a bunch, so I, I won't I'll kind of shelve that one given that it's sort of obvious given the conversations we've had. Uh, but those are the kind of places I like to play where, yep, there's an obvious new technology trend. The other thing is there's always this firewall 2.0, firewall 3.0, right? We're going to bring AI into everything, right? So AI is really good at anomaly detection and what is cybersecurity but a lot of anomaly detection. So uh, I'll, I'll stop there, but I think those are kind of the trends I'm looking at most certainly now. I'd like to say that there needs to be a paradigm shift. Uh, and you know, your point that you just made that uh, security spending tends to follow IT spending. And I agree that that's the way it is now. I, I, I advocate that there needs to be a paradigm shift there and it needs to follow business spending, business value spending. And in, until it does, uh, make that paradigm shift, assets are not going to get the protection that they deserve. Companies are making money so fast. Companies that we never thought would make any money at all are making money so fast that they have to be assessing their investments to protect that data based on that huge spike of, uh, of capital value increase. And that's, where the, that's how they should make the investment decision. And just to add, add to that and also underscore what, uh, what Lucas uh, mentioned, um, I mean, the, the five areas that I talked about earlier, um, data analytics, machine learning, computer vision, um, autonomous systems, ISR platforms, which is basically industrial level IoT, critical infrastructure resource protection. Those are all key areas. Um, cybersecurity is something I think weaves and, and goes and touches every one of those. Uh, a couple areas we didn't talk about, uh, I didn't talk about as a fund, but also you're starting to see uh, investments is, uh, is health records um, and kind of the, the digitization of data. Um, so, I mean, what's, what's more sacred is your, 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 your paper file that's in some office right now. Well, as you digitize that, that becomes yet another attack surface. That becomes yet another piece of data out there that a bad actor is going to want to attack, hack, compromise, and, and, and find a way to operationalize that data against you or against a society or an entity. So I think that's an area of, of, of concern. And then um, commercial space um, or near space is an area that's, uh, that's, that's, that's pun intended, launching uh, pretty aggressively here. Um, as billionaires uh, race to put more and more uh, delivery systems uh, in the marketplace that are delivering, delivering satellites and assets into space, that ecosystem of how those satellites are used to gather intelligence, to share information, computer visions, to cell phone towers in space, all that, uh, again, introduces additional vectors and in, in areas that cybersecurity is gonna be critical to. 
Um, <clears throat> the other area is um, a part of critical infrastructure is food security and supply chain security. Um, again, um, when you look at a nation state, um, if, if I can compromise or if I can attack or if I can weaken any one of those areas, um, I can now weaken my target. So if, if I am going to take any kind of kinetic action or military action, I'm going against a weaker target. I think where cybersecurity is going to go um, as it relates to all these technologies, going back to, to the arms race metaphor, it's going to be no different than the 20, 20th century where you're going to see all sides develop some pretty frightening capabilities, both offensively and defensively, to the point where we're going to get to the area of mutual agreed um, non-destruction in this case. Because um, if we wanted to launch a debilitating attack on the Chinese people or the Chinese uh, government and vice versa and the Russians and whatnot, uh, we all are, are getting to the point where we were capable of doing that. Um, so the reason we don't is we don't want to we don't want to unleash that retribution or, the, or that attack back. So um, it's a it's a peace through strength model. Um, but I think cybersecurity is going to be is going to be, is going to be obviously a, a critical critical part of that at the nation state level. Uh, the applications to to us as individuals, to enterprises, to family offices is a, a, again uh, don't lose sight of the fact that uh, although nation states are attacking each other, um, the soft targets so to speak um, still are. The average person. Thanks, guys. Uh, we have a member of the community here that like to, to like like to ask a direct question. Rob, are you? Uh, you ever? Did you have a question you wanted to like ask the panel? Hey, Rob, we're not hearing you. Yeah, we didn't hear. You. We can hear you now. So okay. I'd start over. Yeah, there's, I'm in a hotel lobby, so there's a little bit of music in the background. The, um, um, you mentioned things like infrastructure, then you mentioned some pretty fast moving things you know, from in the, the software side and other areas. Can, can you all speak a little bit with respect to duration um, from, a, from a LP perspective, how long money would be tied up? Can you speak a little bit about returns as well? And Rick, in your opening, it's great to see Intel both involved. Um, I'd be curious, you know, whether Intel's uh, treasury or some of the pension fund management is dedicated to space versus just being sort of a strategic, uh, a strategic um, uh, a player in it. So I hope you were able to get that marker, Bill. Does somebody want to an answer the first part of the question and then I'll touch on Intel? Sure, I'll, I'll take that. Okay. Uh, so generally speaking, uh, venture capital funds uh, like mine and, and what Hamlet does, uh, there's about a three to four year investment cycle. So that's when we call the original capital investing companies. And then the, the full fund cycle is about 10 years. Um, but don't let that number fool you. The average fund now winds up after about 12, right? So your initial capital is invested over four, you start to get it back in year five, six, seven, and you're mostly done by year 10, but there's usually a couple outliers. Uh, and those outliers are often kind of the bigger winners, right? It takes longer IPO, um, so on and so forth. But that's kind of the, 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 what you're looking at investment cycle wise. And then, you know, I, I can't promise anything about returns, so on and so forth, but for a successful venture capital fund, generally you're looking at three X uh, returns. Right, so uh, cash on cash is pretty good, and then IRRs, depending on timing, um, uh, you know, uh, that, I'll leave it there. The, the other thing that I think is, is shaping this dynamic is traditionally venture. Uh, you invest in a company, it, it raises an A round, B round, C round, D round, does really good, a couple of high fives, and then you go IPO. Um, what we're starting to see is we're starting to see one company stay private longer. Uh, so going and raising money in secondary markets. So uh, early stage investors often are starting to see income events that are happening a little bit sooner. Um, so that's that's one thing that's changing that dynamic. Uh, the other part of it is, um, and this I think will be a good um, uh, leapfrog into Intel, but uh, one of the folks that we work very closely with is uh, the various different venture groups in and around the aerospace defense industry. Um, and these guys are starting to embrace early stage innovation that's happening at the startup level because they're starting to view the, uh, the disruption that's happening at startup as kind of their R&D pipeline. So they're buying and acquiring technologies um, earlier. Uh, they can onboard uh, within their enterprises. So if you're a cybersecurity company or if you're an AI company and you're dealing with large scale enterprise or the federal government, if a uh, scrappy startup coming out of Silicon Valley or elsewhere 
is creating a better boss trap, you want to buy that company uh, and integrate those feature sets within your your uh, your all your your overall overall offering, whether you're dealing with a bank or you're dealing with with a DoD. Yeah, look at, before we hand it off to Rick, I'd just like to touch on that as well because I come from the investment side of the world, but yeah, I came from the investment side of the world. But liquidity cycle management is really what you're talking about, Rob. Is yeah. How do you compress liquidity cycle? Speaking, LPs, LPs can see money back, and there are trends at Hamlet and Lucas have pointed to that are making that longer, and that's a re- that's a, a, a reality, you know, and the. It's a reality because the winners are staying private longer. There are, as you know from the, the community here, there are there is an active secondary market being developed uh, to take those positions away from LP so they can get liquidity earlier. So, and a lot of the growth funds are deploying vehicles like that. I think you referred to that, right, Hamlet? Uh, so, uh, you know, having said that, you know, just like to pass it on to Rick, and so you can answer the intel part of the question. Yeah, I think when you think about Intel and how we look at cybersecurity, there's multiple levels of investment. Uh, I talked about that there's a technology part of the investment, right? And more and more you're seeing the integration of cybersecurity, uh, of defense type of features into the platform. So just as we're, as you're looking at the deployment of systems, just uh, pay attention to that, right? Whether it's uh, at the cloud level, PC level, et cetera, there's features and capabilities that are being built in. So if you buy you know, the most recent generation of PC technology, you will see that we offload virus scanning to the graphics processor unit. And so we're, we're sort of building that into the platform, right? So we try to give you something that uh, mitigates your risk out of the box. Second is we do uh, quite a bit of work on research and development in, in cybersecurity. I, put, I, I, I posted a link here on our work in quantum computing, but there are other areas. And our Intel labs are usually, from time to time, we will host public forums where we talk about where we see cybersecurity from a research and development point of view. And then to your question, Rob, on the Intel Capital, that some of you may have collaborated with Intel Capital before, may have heard of Intel Capital, we, have a, we, have, we do have security as a segment. And so we, we make investments in companies in the cybersecurity space. That's another place for you to not only watch, but if you want to collaborate with Intel Capital, let me know. And I will be more than happy to broker uh, an introduction to the segment managers in this space so they can work with you. All right. Anybody else have any questions? Feel free to just raise your hand and uh, go. But at this point, well, we'd really. I have one, Mark. Is there. Do the guys have any favorites in the public market space? Because it's been a pretty volatile area. Do you have any thoughts on? investment opportunities from the public companies? I, I, um, we're early stage, so not on our end. Yeah, I, I wouldn't give advice. Uh, I will say that my, what's the right way of putting this? I tend to personally like CrowdStrike. I tend to personally like Palo Alto. I think they're both set up pretty well, but I don't really follow that world. I don't, you know, like, and their prices are crazy right now. So again, you know, don't take that as advice. Take that as, hey, go ask someone smarter than me about public stuff. But from a technology standpoint, those are my two, the two kind of guys I like more. All right. Any other questions? Stephen, that sounds like an area of research for you <laughs> or one of your affiliates, right? I was looking for validation. <laughs> I see. <laughs> Thanks. It's a great question. Uh, it was a gap on our panel, I guess. We should have had a public equity yeah. panel, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. So any other questions uh, before we wrap it up? Mark, this is Rob. But Stephen, wouldn't though, like something like Google also fall under, you know, that batch, just, uh, just given, you know, some of the coverage areas? Well, I think, I think the big tech companies, the big defense companies are, you know, where a lot of them, the spend is uh, aside from the, the crowd strikes and the Palo Altos of the world. Mm-hmm. So. Well, keep, keep in mind, the defense contractors of the 20th century were Lockheed Martin, uh, Harris, uh, Raytheon, Boeing, and, 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 the, and the whole lot. Um, who's, who are the two firms you guys are hearing right now that are pieing or uh, are, are fighting for the big pie of the DOD budget right now? It's Microsoft, it's Google, it's Amazon. Hey, so, yeah, so I mean, the, the tech companies are fast becoming. Uh, part of the defense ecosystem. So it's a, it's a changing landscape. 
Um, 20th century war is not going to be fought by tanks. It's going to be fought by, by cyber and tech. I, you know, what a, one of the players out there, a leader of a nation state, said three days ago, the next war with the West will be asymmetric. Uh, yep. and, you know, and that's how Moscow, Moscow is, you know, basically told us what they're doing. <laughs> Putin stole my line. I've been saying that for about four years. So he had yeah, my okay. system. I think. No, I'm kidding. I'll make sure we reach out to him and let him know. Yeah, no, yeah, I'm, my, I'm not a fan of his. I'm sure he's not a fan of mine. Yeah. Okay. Doesn't seem like we have uh, any other uh, questions, but uh, yeah, I'd like to thank everyone on the panel. What a terrific panel and uh, what a terrific, diverse set of views. And, uh, you know, really appreciate participating and uh, making this a lot easier for us to organize. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thanks, thank all. you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Great job. Really great. Thank Thanks, you. Thank you.